Um, all right, we're back. <laughs> and we're back, and we're better than ever. We're back with more Milliband. Um, wow, here we go. High energy, <laughs> love it. Uh, going back into the good stuff after a week of fantasy. Yeah, um, t- touching home, returning home, touching base. Returning home, yeah. Classic. Um, how you doing? How's this week, man? Um, I'm, all, I'm all right. I'm mm. all right, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm more decisive than last week. Yes. No, no awkward pause. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> that was the one, right. editing the podcast, that was the one pause I thought about elongating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am, well, mm. we're fine. Yeah, but I think, I'm all right. I'm um, tired. Yeah. What else has happened? What else has happened? I'm I was very listening cold. to that, uh, King Gizzard album yes. that you recommended. To yes. Me, oh my god. It's very King good. Gizzard. It's very good. Um, what a c- c- curious band. I mean, I, I, so I knew awesome. they existed, and then it was. I watched a video review of their last album. Uh. And I was like, okay, I'm going to listen to this. Yeah. Mostly because it was conceptually, it sounded really cool. But uh, it was only in learning that that basically all of their albums are just a different <laughs> genre entirely. Different. Kind yeah. Of thing. And this new one, oh my god, dude, this new one <laughs> uh, came out recently, very recently. Was that, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, oh today, our perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, we're gonna have to. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I just start pretending. Or yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, came out, came out today, and uh, I think they've been listening to a lot of Alton Goon. I think they've been listening uh-huh. to a lot of uh-huh. like Turkish. Yeah, yeah, Turkish I was going to say like, it's, it's a bit about, isn't it? And we were talking a little while ago about um, North African music. Well, mm. I mean, maybe I just can't differentiate the, <laughs> the genres, but. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's be- me being culturally insensitive by suggesting no mis- misattributing. It's the music. <laughs> There's a little bit of that, a little bit of that kind of like. It, yeah, man, it rocks. So yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each each song is just like whoa. It takes you in such a different place. Mm-hmm. I was just listening to it, just grooving down at the allotment. Allotment news, by the way. Dan and I got our first crops in. Um, I, had, I played no part in this. <laughs> I made a pilgrimage. It's nice the collective, the collective endeavor. Yeah, yeah. I made a pilgrimage to the uh, garden center. Got some autumn sowing broad beans. Don't know if I like broad beans or not, but I'm excited to grow them. It's going to be they've great. Got a lot of food in them, I think. You do? I think I think they've got a lot of calories. They've got quite a lot of protein in them. Oh. Hmm. So come like uh, post post the Brexit apocalypse, <laughs> yeah, you might yeah. to live off the broad beans. We'll just have <laughs> for, broad beans for like a week or something. Yeah. <laughs> One broad bean a day. That's my my allowance for living in England. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we got all that, all so good this, stuff. Yeah, this, that, this, that. Um, it's been very cold recently, and yes, that's about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the last week for the review of the weather. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we, we can't become a podcast where we just review the weather every and week. And now we're I mean, talking I'd about be, the weather. I feel for that. But yeah, yeah, maybe it's cold maybe. and it's wet. It's cold, it's cold and, wet. and it's wet and it's dark. It is very dark once yeah. again. Um, every day it gets dark. Mm. 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 So we got that going for us. Done, that's it. That's, it. You, that's pretty much else? it. Anything yeah, else? I've been working. Um, it kind of sucks. It's it was like okay when I was I would leave work and the sun was setting that was kind of fine because it was like oh a nice walk back whatever uh-huh. but now that it's like it's dark an hour before I leave it's just like ugh. Uh, yeah it's brutal <laughs> it's brutal I need it's one of those dark like when you get there and it's dark when yeah, you leave exactly I need yeah, one of those like yeah, that's been my, sun boxes my, yeah, I've or been something. feeling a great deal more bitterness towards <laughs> the idea of giving up all of the useful time in a day uh-huh. to to a job exactly. Uh, it's frustrating. Yeah. It's well, we should frustrating. do something about it. We should do something about it, yeah. <laughs> Although I will say, the other day, earlier this week, I went in like an hour before the store closed and then stayed for a while, like a long while afterwards. Uh-huh. Didn't get back until like 11 or something like that. You think hanging out with your boss? Yeah, it was just that work needed to get done for Christmas, oh, stuff like that. Um, we were setting stuff up, getting you know, like ahead on deliveries and stuff. And that sucked almost more because it was like I had my whole day just knowing that I'd have to go into work when it was dark. And it was just like... Ugh. Oh, you. Oh, sorry, I missed this. So you went mm. in for a late for a late shift, shift in the yeah. evening. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah which, I yeah, thought you could volunteer to stay on. Oh <laughs> no, God, no! <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was nice. Didn't have to deal with customers. That was nice. Um, yeah. yeah, that's about that. That's, that's I don't know. Nice, nice. Weather, job, beans, music. I got it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, was a new album came out today. Um, Alabaster de, tu- de Plume. Oh, really? Album, uh, yeah. A collaboration with Dan Levens, I think his surname is, who is Dan Alog from oh, cool. uh, The Comet is Coming. Oh, so cool. So I haven't listened to that yet, but that's my counter uh, offer to your, to my your recommendation. <laughs> oh, very cool. So, check, um, it check it out. Yeah, check it out. I saw Comet is Coming. I was listening to them and I thought I saw that they'd put something out recently, but I was wrong. So that's where that story is going. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then we're going to do a show and then, yeah. then it got cancelled. 
like every other. Surprise, surprise. Like everything else. <laughs> oh, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> everything is cancelled. Except it's... for Jeremy Corbyn. He's not cancelled anymore. Oh, he's like half oh, cancelled. still cancelled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, I don't understand that. Explain that to me because, I, I, like, I saw the news right after it happened on BBC and BBC was like, he's back. And then I went back an hour later and they're like, he's actually not <laughs> actually, back. Not back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't get it. What's the point? I mean, I don't know. That, that confusion um, is representative of... <laughs> The, the just the confusion in the brains of everybody who's trying to make a decision yeah. about these things. Yeah, I mean, I think um, um, there was a five-person panel drawn, weird, meant to be in secret, or meant they were meant to be a secret. Mm. Five people drawn from the Labour Party's National Executive Committee, okay, who took a decision on whether he should be allowed in, should be. Um, allowed back into the Labour Party or whether his case should be passed on to some other higher body. I don't mm. know what higher body that might have been, mm. the entire uh, NEC perhaps. Um, they decided, apparently unanimously, <laughs> that he should be let back in. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I think partly because they were perhaps given some legal advice that said, if this goes to court, you don't have any grounds to stand on and he'll just be yeah. have to be let back in anyway. <laughs> yeah. Although apparently there seemed to be some sort of secret, uh, there had been some discussions into the uh, leading up to his readmission, um, which sort of made it seem like, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't there, know. There had been some backroom deals to say, okay, under uh, these conditions, you'll be readmitted and blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay. um, which still seems to, cont- cont- the Labour Party continuing to fly in the face of the recommendations of the um the most recent report, which said that their disciplinary <laughs> procedures ought to be impartial, yeah. <laughs> just to refuse well, to refuse to um, refuse um, to be able to do that. But then, for some reason, Keir, Keir Starmer decided. Well, for well, I don't know whether it's, I said it's not for <laughs> some reason. We can guess quite uh-huh. easily at the reasons. I wonder what it uh, was. But there are multiple potential reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, decided that although he can be a Labour Party member, uh. that does not mean that he's going to be allowed to return to becoming a Labour Party MP. So he's cool, still- <laughs> cool, Kier. You're really awesome. That's great. Um, so this is this is yeah this is this is liberal um, hedging of bets at its uh, at its finest. Kind yeah, of, it's, it's centrism. Yeah, it's centrism, Dan, folks. Dan's actually a fan of it. He's actually becoming more and more partial to Kier Starmer. Yeah, because yeah. he's been watching so much Aaron Sorkin. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, should we put on the tinfoil yeah, but, hat for a moment? Because oh, please, here's yeah. my theory yeah, yeah, about yeah. Jeremy Corbyn that I just came up with right now and holds no water at all. Do you think they got rid of him so that he couldn't, so that there would be like this big news story, so he couldn't say anything about the defense budget increase as it was happening? Uh, there you go. That's my tinfoil hat of the week. I didn't. Thought. Even, well, it sounds quite plausible. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't even know that there was a um, a uh, really? budget increase. To it was sixteen and a half billion dollars. I think it's the biggest defense budget spending increase I don't think it was since Margaret Thatcher but it was something like that something uh-huh. absurd something uh-huh. just disgusting uh-huh. and it's like oh cool couldn't it come at a better time yeah. when we're at war uh-huh. and the economy is doing great uh-huh. I mean right? I, I mean it would at least um, it would at least mean that Keir Starmer is actually capable of organising something yeah like if there was if he, if he did manage to or, or if officials in the Labour Party did manage to conspire <laughs> with the Conservatives to create the most sort of like uh, one of the most dramatic news stories and intra-party uh, flare-ups yeah. at pre- precisely the right time, it would at least mean that K- Kirsten was capable of organising something. Something. And, uh, You'd find a silver lining to everything. Yeah, yeah. Say that. Just that kind of guy. Bless him. Yeah. Bless him. We should get Kier on the podcast. Yeah. Debate me, Kier. Debate me, Kier Starmer. <laughs> no, this is, a, this is an anti-debate podcast. This is definitely an anti-debate podcast. I have no interest in that. <laughs> I would uh, like Kier Starmer to come on and um, we would could exchange uh, hairstyling tips, perhaps. Okay, that would be okay, nice. Okay. Be like, I what do you I, use? Yeah, I don't and think he'd be he like, would. I don't know. Yeah. And I'd be like, he'd be like, what do you use? I'd be like, I don't. Yeah, it's just like brill kit green or some yeah. kind of pomade. Pomade. Or maybe, what pomade do you use, Kier? Yeah, yeah. Mm. He just puts his head in the in jar my, of hair gel. Oh, I was gonna say he could put his head on my head, and then I just rub some off. Oh, see, All right, okay. so now we're just He's talking about Kier Starmer's hair gel. But but it's a bit. It raises the important point that like. What would if you wanted to engage Keir Starmer about his interests? What the <laughs> yeah. fuck would they be? <laughs> what would they be indeed? I mean, we could have Jeremy Corbyn and he could tell yeah. us all about broad beans, and it would be yeah. excellent. Oh my like, god, Jeremy, <laughs> come on the pod, talk about talk beans. About, yeah, talk about the allotments. It's uh, great. It's great. Oh my god, I bet you Jeremy Corbyn has an insane allotment. He yeah. must. 
Yeah. He's always at like I mean, community gardens and stuff, but I bet you he has one that he doesn't tell I anyone wonder, about, yeah. and it's just insane. He's does like he have time to tend it? Do you think? I bet you. I mean, apparently, does. these days. Apparently. Yeah, these yeah. days he definitely does. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Well, we're back uh-huh. talking it's... about the one and only <laughs> Ralph Miller Band, <laughs> our friend, friend of the pod, friend of the pod, Ralph Miller Band. Um, I was told recently that he died kind of before his kids kind of like became of age. I should have looked that up. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh-huh. Cause I was talking to someone and I was like, it's weird that like he was like their dad and like, he was like a Marxist and that's kind of like not how the kids wound up. And he was like, Oh, he died kind of before anything. Yeah, but I, I feel like know. if that was my dad, I'd still be like, good book, dad. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe mm. they've read him. I don't know. Mm. I'd be, yeah. Mm. I don't know. We'll get we could, we, could, we could look into the family history <laughs> yeah. of the Miller Bands if we really wanted yeah, to. Yeah, this is an armchair psychology podcast all about that, um, all about family I mean, I dynamics. It's cur- I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've forgotten. I don't know um, what has become of David Miller Band. Is he still alive? Yes. He's yeah. probably got a good allotment too. Mm, uh, maybe. Eh, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. He's probably very regimented. He, 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 he I, I mean, allegedly does some... Mm. I don't know some reprehensible work representing the worst characters and oh. I don't know. I have no doubt. <laughs> yeah. I'm practicing my allegedly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Allegedly, Keir Starmer has great hair. Um, <laughs> so we're told. So we're back talking so about Keir Starmer's been described hair. Described to us. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're back with Marxism and politics. We are on chapter three and a little bit of chapter. four. Four. I was just making sure that they were separate chapters. <laughs> Not that I didn't know what came after three. Two, uh, <laughs> these two sequential chapters <laughs> yeah. numbered sequentially. <laughs> chapter three and chapter seven. Uh, by the way, you're listening to Exaldery Statements. You are. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Jack. My name is Dan. Welcome. 13 minutes, not as bad as, I think, episode four. <laughs> an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, chapter three, Defense of the Old Order, part one. Chapter four, Defense of the Old Order, part two. We're doing part one of that. So chapter three, part one. Chapter four, part two, section one is what we're doing. If you're following along at home. It <laughs> doesn't make any sense. If anybody is reading along at home, <laughs> it might make sense by the end. Do you think episode. it would make a better listening experience if our listeners read along with us not along with us as the show is going but like are we recommend yeah i don't know because like i listen to podcasts where they're doing a read and i'm like oh that'd be a really interesting thing to read exactly yeah um sometimes i listen to podcasts and wish that i could have known what they were going to read in advance so i could have looked at the reading yeah uh but i don't know whether i would ever actually do that yeah um so no Okay. I don't think so. I don't think so. Because so, then they would know that we're not giving them the best representation. That's of, really true. Yeah. Don't read what we're reading. Um, we're doing it so you don't have to. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or to frustrate you enough so that you do. Um, so these, the reason we're doing these two chapters, partial chapter two, section one, as I said, part two, is... Um, <laughs> Subsection. <laughs> yeah. Is because they go together, right? So it's chapter three, the defense of the old order. Chapter four, the defense of the old order, part two. Um so and the podcast will have a defense of the old order part two, yeah. oh, which no. does not correlate with the defense of the old order part two <laughs> yeah. chapter as it appears in the book. The name of this podcast is going to be insane. It's going to be like <laughs> three, four, part two, section one, part one, section one, part two. But this, these chapters are all about, I was kind of trying to find like a connection between the two, and I guess it's all about the state and ideology, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose so. I mean, yeah. Huh? I mean, I, I suppose it's worth uh, recapping or reconsidering where we left off with this book. Um, After uh, you. In, <laughs> if you recall, Jack. Yes, Dan, <laughs> Once upon a time. I do recall. Now, you, what, 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 what happened? Uh, we have previously read chapter two. And, uh, and yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, you're right. The introduction is also chapter one for some reason. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, um, very anyway. odd. Um, which is all about uh, class and class conflict, and he left off um, with a long discussion about class consciousness, mm. and also um, to some extent with the question, why no revolution? Why no revolution? Um, and so this this chapter is well, these next two chapters are sort of like trying to posit some possible ex- explanations for why um, the proletariat did not follow. As of yet, mm. it's um, a historic mission that was given by Marx and subsequent Marxists of um, 
overturning the world order and making a new one in its own image. <laughs> At least it wasn't a hard job. Hmm. Um, yeah, to ask a lot. Yeah, yeah no kidding. <laughs> So, um, I'll just start us off with a little cheeky little quote. Um, he basically starts it off by saying that one of the biggest problems with classical Marxism, as he puts it, writing in 1977, is that there has been not much study of, uh, of kind of what you're saying, of the ideology of, like, of class consciousness, and of there hasn't been much of a study of class consciousness as it relates to politics, right? So he basically says, um, I'll kind of shoehorn this quote in. He says, <laughs> as a result of that, um, Marxism as a theory of domination remained poorly worked out. It was presented with a very large question of why capitalism was able to maintain itself despite the crises and contradictions on which, by which it was beset and tended to return to a series of answers which were manifestly inadequate. In particular, it relied on an explanation based upon the Marxist view of the state as an instrument of capitalist coercion and repression. But coercion and repression could not possibly, in the case of many, if not most of these regimes, explain why they endured, nor did a second line of mainstream explanation serve the purpose, namely that it was betrayed by reformist labor leaders, since this left the whole question of why the working class was allowed its why the working class allowed itself so regularly and so blatantly to be betrayed. So I messed that quote up pretty badly, but basically what he's saying is it's still kind of an open question as to why that's exactly what you're saying why has the working class let itself be betrayed so often right yeah, and yeah. to him uh, it's about class consciousness but it's not a super clear-cut question you can't mm -hmm. just say it's mm -hmm. oh it's because of this mm -hmm. and he says that in the past a lot of marxists have basically just said well because the state is just this ultimate tool of repression and coercion that is you know controlled by the capitalists at the top and it just keeps the working man down right yeah 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 yeah. We put in a bit of a bind. Well, it's a bit of a contradictory position we put in. The state is so <laughs> thoroughly powerful that um, the the working class are cowed into a position of um, complete subservience, and at the same time have this historic mission, which will lead them to inevitably overthrow capitalism. Kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and but I mean, both are both are both cause a great many limitations in. Marxist theory because well obviously if you if you set your opponent up as such a powerful adversary then obviously yeah. there's no way to overcome it and also if you assume something almost kind of like teleological and ahistorical of uh, your um, preferred political agent kind of mm. thing then it leads to a, a, a subsequent sort of under theorizing of what 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 call, what what motivates certain mo, what motivates the political action of the proletariat kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because all of the ideas he throws out. I was just saying to Dan, this is like the classic, like you know, I'm writing a book on like political theory. So let me just outline why everybody else is wrong, right? <laughs> um, and hopefully by the end of this book, he'll get to some uh, kind of like actual like <laughs> yeah exactly exactly some theories about how things could possibly change. Uh -huh. But for a lot of this, he's basically just saying, kind of in classic Miliband fashion, mm -hmm. here's what all the Marxists say, mm -hmm. uh, and here's why they're wrong, mm -hmm. right? And it all I guess it, for him it all kind of just comes down to um, uh, oversimplification, right? So they set up these big things like, you know, overarching theories of history and of politics, like the state just doesn't let anybody do anything because it's always controlled by the capitalists at the top. And if the capitalists, what the capitalists say goes and what they don't doesn't, right? Um, but then he also says that one of the explanations Marxists like to give for why no revolution, why no big old class consciousness is kind of like the traditions of of i suppose like the proletariat and stuff like that mm -hmm. and so he, he he spends a lot of this chapter kind of talking about the immature marx right which is basically just him quoting from the manifesto communist manifesto like he did in uh when we read the first two chapters of this book he quotes the manifesto as kind of like that you know classic line of two society is more and more splitting up into two hostile camps directly opposed to each other he kind of says that that's a kind of an immature way of thinking about it mm -hmm. because you know what about the pmc what about the service industry what about white collar workers what about all this stuff in the same fashion he's talking about here he says um in the communist manifesto where there's that kind of classic line about um really over the top language about like capitalism 
crushing everything into dust, mm-hmm. all that's, you mm-hmm. know, forget exactly all what the line is. <laughs> yeah, all that is holy is profaned. Exactly, yeah, about it just destroying everything in its path. All tradition is ripped up and destroyed and torn apart, and then all that's left is what serves capitalism, right? He yeah. says that you can't think like that yeah. because that's a little immature because there yep. are still traditions there, and mm-hmm. the traditions that still exist don't necessarily fall in line with capitalist thinking, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is the mark still very much... Um, influenced by the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment ideas. And you can see that in that quote, right, where it's kind of like um, the Enlightenment comes around and removes all historic mystification uh, under feudalism. People believed all these like ridiculous and outlandish things and they were so confused about their place in the world. And um, the Enlightenment comes along and gives us sort of science and uh, reason Reason, thinking. Um, And so... Early on in his theorizing of capitalism, he sort of posits that capitalism, capitalism, the advent of capitalism is um, largely beneficial for the consciousness of the people who live under it because it removes all these sort of fetters to thought um, and it allows people to think clearly, to rationally engage with the world in which they live. Um, and be sort of like conscious agents in that world, kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. But he, he's also saying that. Um, Marx also says that just by its very nature of all of its contradictions and all of the kind of like horrible realities that it pushes on people, um, there is a tendency to grow towards consciousness, right? And that's extremely broad and extremely vague and can be, uh, you know, uh, kind of like um, stopped or turned around in any number of ways, right? But I'll go back to our boy Miliband because he says that these statements do not really contradict each other. They simply reflect different and contradictory facets of a complex reality in which the opposing forces of tradition and actuality on one hand and the change of the other do constant battle for the consciousness of the working class. From that battle, neither of these forces can emerge totally victorious or totally secure in such victories as they may may achieve. Tradition can never be completely paralyzing, but neither can it rapidly overcome. The problem for victorious revolutions is to prevent tradition from corroding them and ultimately defeating them from within. To topple a regime is seldom easy and is very often difficult indeed. Thank you, (laughs) Miliban. To topple a regime... Oh, I just read that. But it is nevertheless easier to do so and to proclaim a new social order than actually to bring one into being. This is the point at which Lenin and Mao Zedong meet in a common awareness that the revolution each led was under threat from the most deeply ingrained traditions of thought and behavior. Lenin's last years were overshadowed by that awareness, and illness and death cut short whatever attempt he might have made to do more about it. (laughs) Mao Zedong was more fortunate, but to what extent is far from clear. This book was written in 1977. I'd just like to point that out again. So we're going to talk about that. That's what we decided. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. but yeah, there you That's go. The pie, isn't it? Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Whenever we bring up Lenin, who the hell are they talking about? Um, um, yeah, there you go. What do you think about that, Dan? <laughs> These two opposite forces, because op- yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, in that more sort of like uh, early Marx, the Marx of the Enlightenment and the Manifesto, uh, you get this sort of like picture of a clear transition from mystification to. Um, uh, the enlightened sort of heights of the modern rational age kind of thing um, as his theories develop um, we get something presented to as much more like a constant back and forth kind of thing um, and then it's not like a gradual prov- progression as history develops the, the, the working class becomes more conscious of itself mm. but rather that there is this constant back and forth um, sort of like high points and low points kind of thing yeah. And it's more like a feature of capitalist society is this constant sort of like battling for uh, consciousness and to have ideas take hold or to um, to be repressed. But it's worth focusing a little bit on this sort of like dichotomy that uh, he was talking about in that um, in that quote, right? Um, because the the more mature marks, the mature, the marks of capital, um, both thinks that the the mechanics of the capitalist system itself f- start to condition the the ways the people who live under it think about that system kind of thing so there's this realization that capitalism itself is a mystifying force it has its own sort of like 
mysteries. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, certain certain realities are veiled to the people who live under it, kind of thing. Uh, it, it presents itself in certain ways, but actually it functions in others. And obviously, you can you can see that in the entire sort of like late Marxist corpus is this process of like um, revealing the sort of hidden realities behind the appearance of uh, capitalism. Right? There is a there is a there is a, there's, a, there's it's sort of like the way it appears to us. It's, it's sort of form, and then the, the actual sort of hidden substance behind kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, and he 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 brings up he brings up a uh, there's a there's a there's a portion which he quotes which um, is quite analogous or resonant with things that we found discovered in the reading from Ellen Meekson's Wood, where she was saying that um, the well the point that she was making was that by virtue of the fact that the the, the exploitation that happens under capitalism is ec- economic rather than extra economic, like the the actual relations between human beings under capitalism become disguised mm. um, because it the the in that instance the appearance of the relationship is one of free individuals right the uh, yeah the, the mystification the, of yeah, the, yeah, you, relations you, you you as a proletarian have a commodity to sell your ability to work and you sell it to the person that you um you you wish to kind of thing there is no under feudalism there was a compulsion you were tied to a certain exploiter and you um had to work for that exploiter whereas under capitalism you're not tied to any particular exploiter you are ostensibly a free agent um and can sell your labor power um however you will Hmm. um forgetting of course that the addendum to that is that you have no option but to sell your labor power because you have been stripped of all other all of the commodities, but that one thing that you mm. you still have, kind of thing. Mm. So yeah, so that's one example of how the sort of capitalist system comes to um, mystify and disguise the relations um, between human beings. And that 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 theory is um, given its kind of fullest explanation in Marx um, when Marx talks about uh, commodity fetishism. Sure. Uh, where, but I mean, the, I mean, we could do another ref- a later episode to talk more thoroughly about that. I think, but like, uh, the basic gist of that is that um, the our, all of our relationships between human beings in the world uh, become about relationships between commodities. Like, you produce a commodity and you put it out there, and it's only when your commodity goes to the market that its value is revealed, and therefore, like, your connection to all of the labor that's done by all other human beings is revealed in the marketplace and not as part of your activity of working itself kind of thing mm. um a i mean a a, a more uh, sort of like a uh, clear way of organizing something like that would be to like have i don't know somehow have some other way of mediating on relating people's labor to one another kind of thing mm. that would be not living in a market society anymore but living in some kind of like democratically planned Economy, Utopia. Kind of thing. <laughs> well, it's the. I mean, exactly, absolutely. Well, well explained. And I mean, it's the. It's the general idea of like, if you. I think this is like you know, classic guy Louis Blanc might have said this, but it's like in a world where you have to work to survive, it's a crime to just not have jobs for people. Because mm-hmm. it's like if you are unemployed, you're gonna die, right? And that was like <laughs> the whole idea behind the right to work workshops, or whatever they were called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but. but. Just continue very briefly, um, but uh, obviously, like with the quote that Jack um, read out, uh, posited a dichotomy, right? So there's this process of capitalism creating its own mystifications, but then Marx also counterposes to it the idea that the the, the mechanisms of how capitalism organizes production also um, empowers in certain ways the worker, right? It um, it teaches them certain skills and it also puts them together so they can sort of unite and they can see their common um they can reflect on their common existence kind of thing Mm. by virtue of the sort of scale of the productive spaces into which they're put kind of thing this is marx like observing a industrialized and industrializing economy and world economy kind of thing sure and then theorizing what what that would mean Mm. um obviously we can look on it now and sort of think of how capitalism has successfully atomized people or like i mean at least at least in the developed countries the sort of the countries where production isn't still uh, production of like, yeah i don't know yeah <laughs> industrial production isn't the the main area in which everybody works those advantages such that they existed such that they, such as such that marx was actually uh, recognizing a thing that existed then may not now exist and we might need to find new ways to work sure. around that problem kind of thing but 
Yeah. Uh, but but Marx clearly thought that there was this sort of two sided blade kind of thing. But it was it wasn't so much the capitalism. Uh, was an enlightening force, but it had its own mystifications, much like feudalism had its own mystifications, but also it created the possibility for overcoming those mystifications in the people who lived underneath it, kind of thing. Sure. In a new way. Yeah. Whether those things, those, those observations hold true or not. Yeah. Is a, for, yeah. A good for way. Further discussion and debate. And <laughs> yeah, the ages, exactly. I suppose. Yeah. For smarter people than us. But a good, a good way to think about that is much like the way that the contradictions of capitalism, the, pro- the tendency of the profit, the rate of profit to fall can constantly be offset by the capitalist class by like just moving production to Bangladesh mm-hmm. as opposed mm-hmm. to like Michigan. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It's exactly the same thing in this kind of battle that Miliband talks about happening in people's minds for class consciousness, right? It can always, it can, well, not always, but it's going to run out sometime, but it can be offset by certain things. Um, demagoguery is one way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, blaming immigrants is one way of doing it. Anyway, that's kind of... Yeah, but you, you, do, you do make an interesting point that there, there is a sort of like greater um, description of various different ways of relating to Marxism or socialist politics or what have you, where you either recognise it as this sort of constant progression, uh, much more akin to the Enlightenment Marx, or you recognise it as a much more sort of back and forth, um, exactly constant battle where things are constantly churning and there are sort of upswings and downswings. And yeah. uh, there is no like... Um, great conflict coming or there is no final crisis or, or that kind of thing so yeah so yeah. something that something that for us to look out in out for in future readings i think because i think we're going to find it in, in in quite a lot of places this sort of like this dichotomy be- between one which is um this is the second time i've used the word teleology without really explaining <laughs> what it means but <laughs> basically basically it just means that like a theory which um has an ultimate outcome in mind kind of thing like um classical quite sort of vulgar readings of marxism which said that like there was this natural historical progression toward communism would be teleological because there's yeah. of, there is this end point um which we are inexorably moving towards as opposed to um it's not a much more that. sort of like open reading yeah, much more contingent it, on events kind of thing we saw it with I think our, that's, that's what that's more the path that i'm starting to become more familiar with as we sort of re- read some of these readings and i do further reading around this and that kind of thing yeah we saw it exactly we saw it with our ellen meeson's wood reading as a theory of history right mm-hmm. as opposed to this what we what she called the commercialization model or of like just or like the the um the sort of like technological determinism of so exactly yeah as opposed to it just being this like cut and dry idea of like here's how things work and here's a big theory that explains it all and it fits nicely it's like well when you get down into the nitty-gritty things like that don't really hold up right mm-hmm. you can't go into marxism just having this idea of like and we'll get to this but like the state as an instrument of class oppression easy duh yeah. i mean look yeah, at yeah, it yeah. of course that's what it's doing um things are a lot more complicated than that right mm-hmm. And Miliband kind of like relates all of these ideas about like commodity fetishism and about social relations being mystified and stuff like that to um, tradition by kind of by kind of giving a couple of examples. Right. I mean, he talked about the church for a little bit, but he basically said the church has kind of lost a lot of its importance. It's a lot like it's like historical yeah, importance it, 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 in it, European it, countries. It, it's right? like a, a bit of a get out for him of actually having to <laughs> discuss uh, the history discuss, of church. Yeah. 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 Or discuss like. I felt like religion was given short shrift. It's fine. It's an introductory book, and he's allowed to gloss over yeah. things. But like, um, he seems to sort of fall on the side of religion as being one of these mystifying things that supported this sort of historic status quo. Yeah. Um, but it's it's sort of it's its power has been lost, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and in- I'd be much more. In- I'd be quite interested at some point in the future having a more detailed discussion about like possibilities of religion or like not that i'm, I'm particularly <laughs> religious i'm not religious at all in fact then it's a but pentecostal <laughs> <laughs> um no so he he actually spends a bit more time talking about sports right and i think that's a really good at like kind of comparison for what he's talking about because he says unlike church a lot of uh people turning out you know pre-covid every saturday to a soccer game like you get more people turning out to that than any other social activity mm-hmm. in the world right mm-hmm. and so when he kind of brings up lenin and mao he kind of brings up the point that you can't really if you go, have a revolution you can't just try and crush tradition a because it's immoral and b because it's just not going to work right yeah, so yeah. he kind of uses the example of sports as being like a lot of marxist 
And oh man, I was so worried he was going to do this when I was reading this. He's like, a lot of Marxists kind of just tend to be like prim and like, like oh, sports, what a thing of the common. <laughs> it's so silly. You're not intellectual at all. Um, yeah, I thought he was really going to come down on sports. It's like, <laughs> it, it does quote that sort of like um, bread and circuses quote kind of thing. Yeah, like, I maybe, know. Are these the circuses of our yeah. contemporary capitalism? But he brings it back. Thing, but he's a bit more. He's a he bit brings more. it back because he basically says that in this example of like, tradition versus kind of capitalist mentality he talks about how people come together for this kind of like community uh, aspect of sport right which is just cool and you go with all your friends and it's awesome and you watch this great physical activity and it's all cool and it brings you together and it's awesome but at the same time it's just so imbued now with capitalist mentality of Mm -hmm. like he gives a couple of examples, but it's like, just think about how much people make and about how like, yeah, a lot of these people come from working class backgrounds, but it's like, it is all about how much money you're making. It's obviously extremely sexist in the way of like what sports people watch versus what qualities you think are better in sport, mm-hmm. right? He uses the example mm-hmm. of like manly qualities in sport, right? So it's 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 very like it- kind of uneven in a kind of like a financial way. It's uneven in kind of like a gendered way, but at the same time to him, it's like, if you have a revolution, I kind of thought mm-hmm. it was funny because he was like, "If you have a revolution, don't get rid of soccer." It's like, okay, <laughs> won't do that. <laughs> I wonder what football team is supposed <laughs> I think probably Leeds. Okay, just mention Leeds United. Doesn't mean yeah. That, yeah. yeah, it's interesting though, isn't it? Because um, I guess there are several ways you can look at it. You could say that here is this sort of great sort of communal collective thing, and um, capitalists have found a way to exploit it. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, like we we don't we have no interest in celebrating the exploitation. <laughs> or uh, of that sort of desire in people to um, have communal collective experiences. But obviously capitalism is going to exploit for profit and anything that exists in the world that it yeah. can feasibly exploit, <laughs> it will exploit kind of thing. Um, but I guess there's a, a, a bigger question. I'd be interested to know what, how, you reflect, how you'd reflect on this. Um, how much, what the process is whereby those ideologies are actually like forced into and sort of like begin to replace some of those collective ideas kind of thing sure. he does kind of he he does kind of like he does he talks a little bit about the sort of factionalism of sport or maybe that would be a one way you could go like sport does create this kind of like you're, you're collective with the people who support your team and you're potentially sort of opposed to i don't know the, the people who support your rival team yeah um yeah and obviously that would be like quite uh, uh i mean if we wanted if we wanted to um sort of awaken people's class consciousness and make them recognize that their their real enemy is i don't know uh, an, another class kind of yeah. thing it would be a, it would be um it's quite a it, it's probably quite a mystifying thing or quite a like a, it, it, it the 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 adversarial nature of two sports fandoms uh clashing probably gets in the way of people's realizing that their greater enemy is is somewhere else and something else kind of thing yeah i kind of tend to think it's all kind of crap talking about sports like that other than like the money aspect of it because if that factionalism idea gets bought up it's like okay first of all that's not really just like arbitrary factionalism mm-hmm. that's like regional right which is always going to exist right sure, you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's always if anything I, mean, what, I think it does if, i was just gonna say i think it does less of like making people atomized and more of making people proud of where they're from right and having a community it's like I root for the Dodgers because the Dodgers rock and it makes me a little bit more proud to like be from Southern California. But it's like when I say I hate the Giants, it's not like I actually hate the Bay Area and I hate people from San Francisco. It's like, (laughs) it's, you know, it's fun. It's like I see somebody wearing like a Giants uniform, give them a hard time, they give me a hard time. (laughs) Nobody's going to get Brian Stowe, if you know what I mean. But I'm going to tell you what my, I had, I had, when we were were thinking about sport, I've had for a little while this idea of a sort of visual gag that I could do on the (laughs) podcast just to see what Jack's reaction would be. I'm excited. There's no other time that I'm. I mean, I'm going to tell him what it was. I, I, I haven't thoroughly prepared for it, but I, I actually have in my possession um, a um, San Francisco Giants oh my God. T-shirt. Oh my God. Which now would have, been, would have been the best time. To just, to, that would have blown my mind reveal. if you just unbuttoned your shirt and you were wearing a Giants shirt. That would have been insane. Is it a uh, player shirt or is it no, just a shirt? Not, no, it's just like... Interesting. A, it's just like... A, huh. Well, I, I had no idea. I found it in a charity shop. I probably paid £1.50 <laughs> for it. I had no idea. I was like, oh, these are actually a real team. Okay, yeah, I'll buy it. Interesting. Yeah, All right. <laughs> I can see that. The podcast is getting atomized, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Sport, so in conflict, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. otherwise, <laughs> solidaristic relationship. Um, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, it is, I think it is a fast. I would like to read if somebody's ever written, because he basically says nobody's ever written about this. I would like to read a view of sports as. Uh, kind of like the Jack Sipes way of thinking about things of like uh, 
saying I forget the word for it, but like saying that these social relations are okay, make, forcing us to accept these social relations as reflected in a sports team of like, you know, uh, Giancarlo Stanton getting paid like three hundred million dollars or something like that, mm. or like Lionel Messi getting whatever Lionel Messi gets. You know what I mean? Like how that affects our view of the world, how it affects, you know one stadium being built for like a billion dollars mm-hmm. or something like that um interesting interesting mm-hmm. stuff but there is yeah there is something um that we would very much want to salvage and promote in the kind of of like, course yeah in the the collectivity and the the collective joy that people yeah. experience when they're yeah. in the stadium in the stands uh their their team um Scores a home run. <laughs> or or <laughs> some, on the baseball court. Something to that effect. <laughs> on the baseball court, exactly. <laughs> Which is what tends to make me think that it is what you were saying. Um, it is more of this is just like a cool, fun, natural thing that people do that has been parasitically like yeah, 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 evolved yeah, into yeah, like a capitalist yeah, enterprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is disgusting. But, yeah, but yeah, th- this is one of the things that attracts me to that period of um, working class history where uh working class people were still excluded largely from sport or what have you yeah, or like yeah. uh, there were certain sports which were exclusively working class and there were certain sports <laughs> which were upper class and the two never the two shall meet kind of thing mm. um but uh, so also i guess there was there was there was the, the working class people c- gathering together only as working class people to to participate in the playing or watching of a certain sport but also there was like exclusively working class teams for certain sports or an exclusively working class league for a certain sport kind of yeah. thing. Um, yeah, you still kind of see that with what rugby league and rugby union I guess kind of, to right? some extent that yeah. there, there is there is still this divide in the sort of like the class makeup of the, the fans of certain sports in the UK at least. But that kind of maps more onto like British cultural class yeah. divisions or like regional divisions kind of thing yeah. more so than it does quite how it would have done in the 19th century kind of thing it's funny uh, but I, I i do i do to some extent i mean i don't know how recreatable that that kind of culture is but like um i, I do kind of feel like if it were possible to a uh, way to to start progressing toward and reach another sort of high point in working class consciousness where um analogous to the, the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century um i wonder whether a part of that will be once again, I don't know, working class sports teams yeah. or like that uh, sort of a culture, cultural, uh, I don't want to say division, like separation kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's funny because he kind of says to say he says at one point something like to say nothing of how sports teams operated or would operate in a socialist society. And then he just kind of like shrug emoji like, I don't know how that would work. <laughs> but it's funny because it's, it's like yeah. I kind of think it would be the same thing of like. If you just don't pay these people insane amounts of money, it's like it's not like that's going to be horrible. Like if you're Wayne Rooney and you're not making millions of dollars, mm-hmm. it's like you're still Wayne Rooney. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. your life will still be pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And it's difficult for us reading this kind of book because like we can never. We, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's fortunate for us actually. We're, we're in the position of being able to separate um, actually existing socialism mm. as it existed in the 20th century, and then socialism as an idea that we might want to promote in a spy to kind of Whereas Miliband's in the tricky position of like being a socialist, living in a world where there are countries and societies which claim to be socialist. Yeah, good point. We're never really having had any truck with those societies, as we mm. discovered a few weeks ago. Like he was never a fan of the Soviet Union kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But um, he's still it's sort of in a difficult position. So I, when I read this, this vague allusion he makes to how sports functioned under socialism, I sort of thought he was speaking speaking more toward how sports functioned in the Soviet Union. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is curious as well, because like in the Soviet Union, not that I know a great deal about it, I get the impression that sport was very much like the Soviet Union revealing how much, how superior, but the Soviet Union yeah. wanted to reveal in as many ways as it could, how superior it sort of cultural production, as mm. well as its industrial production was to the inferior capitalist West kind of thing. Um, and what the, the, maybe it, maybe it's, um, Maybe it's a um, not a fair representation that we get, but I just sort of imagine this kind of like uh, Russian weightlifters taking ridiculous quantities, of, not Russian yeah. Soviet like weightlifters taking yeah. ridiculous quantities of like steroids or like beaver the, like the, the, the quite the, the sort of the the, the how, how um, sp- the production of um, sports men and women athletes 
in the Soviet Union was sort of very sort of state orientated or mm. an organized kind of thing. They had something to prove. Yeah, <laughs> definitely had something to prove. And then, I mean, in some respects, they proved themselves. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, but it, but, it, but maybe it really, really, it just speaks to maybe it really just speaks to the superior ability of um, the states or sort of in this case a state, but maybe one would hope in a more ideal circumstance a, a sort of more democratically directed. Uh, yeah. planning body yeah. to organise something it is superior to the market in the sense yeah. that like, you, if you can just scour your country and find all of the best people to play ice hockey and you could probably make a world beating ice hockey team <laughs> it's true um, yeah uh, this is now I'm, okay I'm going to talk about baseball for a maximum of a okay, couple I'm minutes okay I'm going to recline <laughs> <on my chair. laughs> because one of the major issues in baseball recently has just been the like knuckle dragging moron who's the commissioner of the of the MLB right okay. and um, nobody likes him nobody likes him at all and one of the main reasons is because you can just so clearly tell that he has no interest in baseball. Okay. He likes like, wow, well, it was pretty classic when he was giving the Dodgers the like he was presenting like the MVP trophy and stuff like that. Of like, pretty sure he was drunk because he was like, ah, what uh, MVP trophy? Yeah, Corey here, I don't know, whatever. Corey, you thrilled our fans throughout the postseason with a great performance. You led the Dodgers to a World Series victory, and it's my pleasure to recognize your great play with the Willie Mays Most Valuable Player Award presented by Chevrolet. And it's just like, you can tell this guy doesn't care about baseball at all, that he's just a businessman, right? And and I've heard a lot of different takes on like how to fix that. It's like, well, you know, the owner is just a he's ba- more or less he's just an employee or not the owner. The commissioner is just a more or less a uh, uh, employee of the owners of the teams, and he just has to do what they say goes, and that's just the way it is. And what are you going to do? It's like, how about if that wasn't the way that it worked, <laughs> and the people who voted for the commissioner were say. Uh, players association or maybe fans because Mm -hmm. we're all Mm -hmm. kind of ostensibly doing this for fans anyway uh, a peek into a socialist future no I mean yeah there is something we haven't really talked about which is the prospect of like fan owned clubs yeah and there is a movement for that in the UK in in the Premier League and the the Football League and more broadly kind of thing we have that with Green Bay and it's kind of the same thing sure yeah Mm. they're just owned by the the, the, ostensibly they're just owned by but they're still like a board of people and sure yeah yeah. Yeah. but that's I suppose that's the problem I mean it's it's a good example right like I mean, we could make it analogous to like cooperatives or something. Like, exactly, it yeah. doesn't really matter how you organize your structure. If you have to operate in a world where everybody else is playing by some other rules, you're yeah. just going to have to play to those rules. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, well, Dan, I'm glad you bought up the state 10 minutes ago because that's where we're going with this. <laughs> eventually, eventually. We're talking about the state. I could go off on Rob Manfred again, but I'm not going to. Is that um, his name? Rob? That is his name, Rob. Rob, Rob Manfred. 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 <laughs> Rob Manfred. Manfred. Uh, classic guy. Absolutely classic guy. You get the feeling that if you were to just go up to him and start talking about the pitches baseball and baseball, he would just be like, huh, interesting. Uh-huh. Who are you? How'd you who's get the, in this room? Yeah, who's the NFL commissioner at the moment? I yeah, get the impression no. he does know something yeah. about this. Ball. Well, that's a funny thing because in the N- in the NBA, uh, Adam Silver, you kind of could go either way on him because he is obviously a businessman, but uh-huh. it's like, oh, he kind of seems like he likes basketball and he knows a little bit about basketball. And yeah, it's like, I mean, we'll it's, it's a totally different that. question, isn't it? Like, if you were a competent businessman, you'd probably just learn to fake yeah, it at least. No kidding. Like, no learn kidding. something about it. Exactly. Like, it sounds like the ultimate troll if he's just like, yeah. I'm just not even going to make the effort. Kind of yeah, he sucks. And he's bad at his job, even just in terms of operating in the capitalist <laughs> system. So it's like, Jesus, dude. Oh, my God. Bad for baseball. I'll say that right now. Anyway, we're talking anyway, about the state. Anyway, anyway. Um, Louis. L- Louis. Louis. Louis Althusser. Louis Al is his middle name. Thuser. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because uh, Miliband, he brings up kind of uh, in a truncated way, he brings up Althusser's ideas of ideology. And he specifically has two most famous ideas, um, which are RSAs and ISAs, repressive state apparatuses and ideological state apparatuses. And what these are, I believe, um, are the ways in which Althusser says... I'm just going to go back and forth between Althusser and Althusser. Oh, <laughs> I like, I like oh, Althusser. Oh, um, oh. This is basically how he explains how ideology is maintained in a capitalist sense on the proletariat, right? So the two ways that those are done, like I said, the RSAs and the ISAs. The RSA, repressive state apparatuses, those are things that kind of does what they sound like. They enforce ideology by force, right? So these are cops, um, military, things like that, right? 
ideological state apparatuses are a little bit more hard to come to terms with, I guess, because that's stuff like the family unit, right? And, uh, you know, media and stuff like that. And all of these things that kind of work together to um, ostensibly keep the capitalist ideology going. And Miliband, I believe if I'm right, if I got this kind of reading correct, Dan, I believe he was kind of taking a little bit of issue with that Mm -hmm. because he was saying that, first of all, it's kind of weird to call those like state apparatuses, right? Like the media is state apparatus because that's, and the family is state apparatus because uh, they're just not, right? Mm -hmm. In a literal sense. But he's also kind of saying that um, it's a little bit too broad because when you say like the family unit, family, like classic American family values, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? That puts forward an idea that doesn't leave room for like uh family values quote unquote that clash with the capitalist system right and he's like well clearly there are you know there are those right uh if you were to just purely operate in a capitalist mentality you probably would really want to have a family for anything other than social reproduction at all right Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's interesting i mean like i said he kind of doesn't spend too much time with um al a friend al but um he does just enough to explain why he was just a little bit wrong, mm. right? And we can have another callback in some ways to Meeksins Wood here, right? Like, mm. um, Hit me with it. <laughs> <laughs> because she posited the difference between, like, wh- one of the things that happens in the transition to capitalism is the separation of the exploiting class from political power. Under feudalism, sure. there were, the, the two were analogous, right? You could exploit because you had political power. Mm. Now, I mean, she presents it as this kind of murky distinction, and... Um, Miliband similarly presents it in this murky distinction where clearly the state is enforcing capitalist norms, right? It makes possible, it make it sort of it sets down the basic conditions for capitalism to operate through like legal norms, through um, repress what he describes as that like repressive state apparatus, right? Like sure. puts in place a police and a military mm. to sort of protect property and to protect the the board, the integrity of the market, the borders and what have you. Mm. Um, but Miliband is suggesting that Althusser goes far too far in basically attributing to the state by using the phrase ideological state apparatuses. He's he's saying that like all um, cultural production, all enforcement of traditions and norms falls under the purview of the capitalist state, and mm-hmm. he's not maintaining this separation between. Um, I think Miliband talks about class power and state power. Sure. Um, and the two um, are not one and the same. They're, they're not one and the same. They do mm. play into one another, uh, but there is a separation which he's very keen to to point out. Right. In a way that Althusser is not. Now, I, I mean, I, I don't really know very much about Louis Althusser. I think um, uh, his his um, theories are uh, structuralist, largely in nature, kind of thing. So it doesn't surprise me that he's creating these sort of like totemic monoliths kind yeah. of thing uh, the system is the system a, a thing in of itself and it all sort of weaves together which is not necessarily wrong mm. but also as too, we've been saying like there is a lot more granular detail that we should be looking for right um particularly if we want to poke holes and maybe great chasms and yeah uh, dismantle entirely yeah the system yeah. in the system. <laughs> this is this is why I asked Dan before we started recording if Althusser became an anarchist later in life because I could kind of see that happening. I don't know, maybe he didn't, but I kind of get the feeling he did with this kind I of. I don't talk. know. I think he was. I, don't, I mean, I've been very defensive of Althusser in the past. <laughs> now I don't know. Now I'm probably willing to just write him off as a pseudo Stalinist and, and <laughs> or at least who like, isn't a pseudo Stalinist? <laughs> Jesus Christ! I mean, we're, we're, we're at least I we would like. With condition, happily describe ourselves as communists. I'm sure there are people sure. in the world that would quite, yeah. who would, uh, I mean, would think so much, would read quite a lot into that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> far yeah. more no than this. Pretend- I mean, be- being mistaken for a Stalinist is probably preferable to being mistaken for someone who is in league with the world order that's presented by. <laughs> QAnon people. Oh, man, like. I had no idea where you were going with that. I was oh, like, right, with so... Hitler? I was oh, no, like, wait, no, no, what? No, 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 no. Uh, no QAnon, just, we'll the el- just the elite pedophile rings. The elite pedophile rings. <laughs> I, Which, was, I was watching some stuff about the, that today, uh-oh. so that's why it's on my mind. Just a little uh-oh. bit, just a little bit. Just Dan little just kind of dipped his toe into QAnon. Uh, yeah, I did a little bit of research. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll get there. I, I hope not. <laughs> Have you 
cracked open. Although I do actually the book that I I, I read. Yes, I read the uh, the introduction, and that maybe whoa, the was it the premise crazy. or like well, okay, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, get yeah, there. Yeah, but yeah. whoa, the introduction. Yeah, whoa. yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa. yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the state. Yeah, I thought it was going to build. <laughs> to a conspiratorial end, but mm. no, it starts with a conspiratorial it does. beginning. It does. <laughs> and I hope that Wait thread is maintained. Wait till you get to the end. Wait till you get to the end, uh, so that's yeah, all I'll yeah, say. I mean, yeah. I think it's probably going to be quite a readable book, but it still yeah. might take me a little while. Oh, it's so a tome. Yeah. It's a tome. Um, episode yeah. 50, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a special, a special. Oh, yeah, Patreon a uh, app. One year. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> the first um, <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's not gonna. <laughs> first Patreon. I'm, dollar. I'm, I'm like systematically failing to do any promotion for this podcast at all. Yeah, promotion. So. Who cares? We're never gonna get to that point. I don't think this. This much like I would like to see the MLB become a more community driven uh, institution. We're not interested in, in engaging with capitalist practices here. Yeah, Send yeah, this yeah. to all of your friends, please. I'm begging you. I check the <laughs> I check the analytics every single day. Um, <laughs> We'd like to stop being like proletarians and somehow like <laughs> yeah, one of these days. One of these days, we'll see it's the means of podcast production. Uh-huh. At um, least, at least become like I don't know. Uh, mm. What's the word? Um, <laughs> PMCs. PMCs. <laughs> podcast managerial class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Althusser anyway, in the state is where we were. <laughs> so basically, yeah, Miliband's like Althusser. He sums up, you know, what was a very long academic career of Althusser's uh, very quickly, but just being like. You fool, you used the word state, you absolute buffoon. Um, And then he basically goes on to really get into the meat of it and to explain why all Marxists are wrong when they claim that the state is an instrument of class uh, oppression and domination and obstruction and uh, collusion or whatever, I don't know. Um, But he brings up three main ideas that Marxists usually kind of point to to prove you point to and go, it's, I see it's a state instrument class oppression. And they basically all kind of come down to this idea that we've been talking about as once you get into granular detail, that doesn't really hold up um, because it's hard to just assign one motivation to an extremely large group of people and, and to say nothing of that structure itself. So the first one... Hang on, what was the first one? I'm glad you're going to lead the way on this, because I really can't remember. <laughs> I, have, I have another reference to Meeksons Wood to make in a little while. So. <laughs> well, ring the Meeksons, uh, Meeksons Wood bell when you want to when you want to do that. Um, so yes, the first reason is, I'm just going to quote him, because he does a better job of explaining it than me. He says, Marxists have, in effect, given three distinct answers to the question, none of which have ever been adequately theorized. The first of these has to do with the personnel of the state system. That is to say that the people who are located in the commanding heights of the state, in the executive, administrative, judicial, repressive, and legislative branches, have tended to belong to the same class or classes which have dominated the other strategic heights of the society, notably the economic and cultural ones. So that's pretty kind of tempting for me to say because it's like you look at the supreme court of the united states and we're constantly being told like damn look at how diverse these people are Mm -hmm. we got all sorts of people on here look at that it's they're just representing all of these different views america's diverse end of don't ask him a question end of case case closed Mm -hmm. but it's like okay every single one of these people went to yale or harvard (laughs) you know what i mean it's like i think the diversity candidate was r rbg rgb ruth bader ginsburg rgb no rbg Ruth Bader, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, it's RBG. funny, isn't it? I think, I think of that as being... What, uh, what's the word? Um, it's not an acronym, is it? Is it an acronym? Or an, well, I guess it's for a name. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Her initials <laughs> sort of rolling off the tongue. But actually, yeah, it does, it I've tried to do it a few times, and it really doesn't... Yeah, I don't know why it even uh, ever... I mean, that's just... I think it's just an effort to make... Mm, it's, cool. it's, the, it's, the, it's the cult personality of Ruth Queen. Bader Ginsburg. Queen, absolute queen, rest yes, in power. Queen. Actually, I said that they all went to Yale or Harvard. I don't know if the new one did. And I literally, I don't even know her name. Uh, whatever. I don't know that. Who's the other, the guy? Brett Kavanaugh. Brett Kavanaugh. I think he went to some like preppy high school, probably. All the, well, anyway, I mean, all these people are the same okay. disgusting milieu of freaks. And yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, it's the same. You look here, like, oh, you hear all these stats about like uh, people at the BBC or people writing mm. for various like. Mm journalistic outlets and they're all like 98% Oxbridge yeah. and like, yeah. Uh, yeah. well you look at the cabinet and they're all like I mean it's particularly egregious in, 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 when you look at conservative cabinets but um, the Labour Party's gotten it, is, is descending toward well it, at least it was in the sort of like the new Labour era yeah. where what basically what it promoted was people who'd studied these subjects at university kind of thing 
Yeah. Um, Did you know that every single person in Boris Johnson's cabinet is a Tory? <laughs> <laughs> That's da, da, da. yeah. So checkmate, Miliband. <laughs> um, no, but anyway. So anyway. So while that's kind of true, Milliman makes the point that it's like okay, it's also not because mm-hmm. it's like as much as we want to be like contrarian Marxists, like leftists, it's like, that's not true. It's not mm-hmm. true that everybody who's in the government uh, holds a commanding height in the other, you know, command structures of society, the economy and stuff sure. like that. It's like, that would be impossible. Look at how many people work for the government. Just like, that's yeah, just blatantly yeah, yeah. not true. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you do have some successful working class people or whatever, or just people who don't come from these sick freak schools, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But what they're able to get done, what they do when they get there, different question. Yeah, right? yeah. He makes a couple of examples. I'm going to ring my bell now. <laughs> <laughs> he points to the 19th century when the people that were um, uh, in political power were largely actually people still connected to uh, the aristocracy mm. in lots of ways. Um, landowning aristocracy. The landowning yeah. aristocracy. Bastards. Those guys. Those guys. <laughs> Rent is. We do have an um, allotment. So this is my, but my, <laughs> we rent it though. <laughs> we do rent the allotment. Thank God. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, 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 um. But no, if if we if we look at Mixes Wood, she she pointed out that like um, the transition to capitalism happened when uh, the landowning aristocracy decided that they were going to uh, change the relationship to the land in which they own, kind of thing. They were integral in mm. bringing about. Um, capitalism and they knew from the off that they knew how to profit from instituting capitalism as the mode of agricultural production yeah that's my touche that's my answer I'm yeah. give, I'm, touche I'm, I'm, they were actually I'm, bourgeoisie I'm, I'm giving Miliband an answer <laughs> <laughs> they were they were um, they were they were more inculcated in the capitalist system than he necessarily yeah. suggests that they were yeah um, obviously like 200 year old politics not particularly useful doesn't it you got him and he, do, I mean, he does also, he does also talk about people from the working class who've made their way up to be yeah political leaders of various sorts or like people from the working class like to... a certain person in american politics who you know bartender uh worked her way up and to be an intern with ted kennedy is that true <laughs> wait a minute oh well Anyway, so to sum that one up, to basically throw that one in the trash can, he says, there is no necessary unanimity of views among the people in question, meaning uh, in you know politics and government. And there may be fairly deep differences between them on this or that issue. But these differences occur within a specific and fairly narrow conservative spectrum. So that's just kind of like throwing a bone to like, yeah, but it's basically true, though, anyways, mm-hmm. right? Like the people actually making the decisions... It's, you know, there yeah, I mean, of, I think the theme that's going to develop is there is some truth to yeah. all of these things. Yeah, um, just don't get hoodwinked into you're, a big you're narrative. Gonna, yeah, 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 yeah. You might yeah. need a little bit of all of them plus some supplementary stuff. Yeah. <laughs> There's more work to do, people. There's more work to do. <laughs> more work to do. Number two, the reason why Marxists always say that the state is a, a tool of uh, capitalist domination is... I'll just quote him. He says, the second answer which Marxists have tended to give to the question of why the state should be thought of as an instrument of capitalist ruling class has to do with the economic power which that class is able to wield by virtue of its ownership and control of economic and other resources and its strength and uh, influence as a pressure group in a broad meaning of the term. He goes on to say, capitalist enterprise is undoubtedly the strongest pressure group in capitalist society. Obviously, it's named after them. And it is indeed able to command the attention of the state. But this is not the same thing as saying the state is the instrument of the capitalist class. Yeah, so that one he kind of just shoots down pretty easily as being like, it's not one-to-one. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. There is a correspondence. Of course. Um, but it's not one-to-one. Mm. I don't know what the, what the... Well, I mean, yeah, we'll have to sort of like spend more time passing the implications of that at some point. Mm. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah, just yeah. say it's a lot easier if you work for the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, as it was formerly <laughs> named, to be like, there's some guy stirring up trouble in Iran and perhaps the government could help us just out? Question mark. Knock it on the head, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, as it is, it's not as easy for mm-hmm. but I think, I think that's not a great example because I think scenes. the government had quite a significant share in... <laughs> I, British uh, Anglo Iranian. True, true, but I'm talking about the American. <laughs> oh, I see. We okay. did that. Nice okay. try. Okay. Well, actually, okay. it was kind of you guys, too. Okay. Read the book. Read the book. Read, Read the, the book. book. <laughs> um, so, yeah, num- the second answer shoots down pretty quickly. Uh, but all of these people have uh, stakes. You know, Nancy Pelosi has stakes in real estate all around the city. Of course, she's going to act in her. Uh, uh, interests politically. And it's like, yeah, of course you will, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you can't use but, that as like a broad theory yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, but also it's the. Um, 
people in political power have learned, and also people who vote people into political power in sure. a lot of ways, have learned to consider what is best for the capitalist class as being what is best for the nation in its entirety kind of thing. What's yeah. best for... So it's that kind of like... Yeah, you hear it all the time. Like, the, uh, Either politicians or uh, business people make some kind of appeal to the necessity of like doing things which help job creators or yes. the like kind of job thing. creators there yes. is this sense that um the the capitalist economy is the sort of the bedrock of the nation and yeah. thus it needs to be um it needs to be helped in, in as many ways as possible kind it's of ideology it's ring concerns the, yeah it's concerns are the only legitimate concerns exactly ring the meekson's wood bell again because it was like when she when she said <laughs> when she said um uh, when we talk about producers, who do we talk about? We don't talk about the people making the things. Yeah, we talk yeah, about the yeah, yeah. you know people owning the factories to make the cars, whatever. Yeah. Number three, uh, and this one actually, it, it, number two kind of contradicts number three in a way, because he says, in particular, uh, this leaves out the account of the third answer to the question posed earlier as to the nature of the state, namely a structural dimension of an objective and impersonal kind. In essence, the argument is simply that the state is an instrument of the ruling class because, given its insertion, insertion, insertion <laughs> into the ca capitalist mode of production, Jesus, it cannot be anything else. Yeah, I mean, that one's pretty attractive because it's just like, well, it's operating within these bounds. Yeah, it's not yeah, going to yeah. operate outside I mean, of those bounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is an explanation that I've fallen back on quite a lot of times, mm. like, um, I mean, this comes similarly comes back to when we were talking a little bit about class and sort of like um, debates I've had before. Like, is the capitalist class malign and evil, or yeah. are they just like acting because that's the only way they know how to act? Kind of thing. Like, yeah. the capitalist economy demands certain things of them. Um, they are impelled with a necessity to. Um, make a profit at all costs mm -hmm. uh that is the only motivation that anybody ha that, that anybody has in mind really yeah um it's very easy to fall back on structural explanations i.e uh blaming the function of capitalism but as we've said that sort of sets up this kind of monolith which is very difficult to engage with and work with i mean that's not a good example uh, to, to say that um it leaves us little room to maneuver isn't a good enough disproving of yeah. the structural, the structural <laughs> theory on. kind of thing <laughs> but 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 um what hope do we have oh god Jesus. <laughs> uh, if, if 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 not um ah. if it if it is not the case that sure um our agency means something perhaps exactly or that there are conflicting um parties or that there are contradictions in that sort of mm. monolith or yeah uh, yeah, totally. are exploitable and we can work with and like yeah good avenues for socialist political action structuralism is like very uh it makes it makes you feel good when you think about it because it's just a kind of bit of an escape goat yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah for like all of your yeah, anxiety yeah and it does, your... it does yeah and it does it does feel like you can it, it's like a i have fully grasped the system <laughs> kind of thing like, it's like a meme of the guy with a huge brain like, yeah yeah like sitting, sitting on his, his brain yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah yes structuralism yeah smoking out the user's pipe <laughs> um the strength, our friend Miliband says, of the structural explanation is that it helps to understand why governments act as they do. For instance, why governments pledged to far-reaching reforms before reaching office, and indeed elected because they were so pledged, have more often than not failed to carry out more than, at best, a very small part of the reforming program. Yeah. That's again, it's kind of like a scapegoat. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. if Bernie got elected, it's like, why did why didn't Bernie bring about Medicare for all, much yeah. less socialism? It's yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah. Re really? <laughs> you, you child, you absolute child. Again, sitting on my brain because it's so big. Um, the weakness, he says, of the case is that it makes it very easy to set up arbitrary limits to the possible. There are structural constraints, but how constraining they are is a difficult question. And the temptation to fall into what I have called the hyperstructuralist trap, which deprives agents of <laughs> any... <laughs> of any freedom of choice and maneuver and turns them into bearers of objective forces to which they are able unable to affect it's yeah so it's kind of what you're saying it's like it gets into free agency it's like really are these structural issues so vast that it's just impossible to get past mm -hmm. no but it's, it's hard right it's very hard um and again yeah good scapegoat 
I, I like thinking of that whenever there's like the classic philosophy student like ah oh, do we have free agency or not man yeah, that, I'm like me. damn <laughs> <laughs> yeah just it just, just slap just, a structuralist just explanation scratch, just, on just it scratch my surface and what there, there is the kind of like, <laughs> and it hurt <laughs> the, <laughs> there, there is the sort of proverbial sort of like uh, mm, the proverbial but, the, 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 yeah. the proverbial skin yeah, I was gonna say like. Uh, <laughs> Like a scratch. Purveyor of bong grip takes. Oh, okay, yeah. The bong grip takes. <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't had any bong grip takes yet. Actually, no, I had one earlier. I forgot what it was, though. We had definitely a bit of a bong grip take. Hmm, interesting. I'll go back and put the well, sound yeah, effect. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll start oh. watching that for a while. <laughs> um, anyway, to finish it up, he says, taken together as they need to be, these three modes of explanation of the nature of the state, which, to recap, the character of its leading personnel, the pressures exercised by the economically dominant classes, class, and the structural constraints imposed by the mode of production constitute the Marxist answer to the question of why the state should be considered as the instrument of the ruling class. Yet, there is a powerful reason for rejecting this particular formation as misleading. This is that, while the state does act in Marxist terms on behalf of the ruling class, it does not, for the most part, act at its behest. Yeah, there you go. Seems like he, he takes a lot of pages to just say that. <laughs> it's like, it's simple as that. Um, a lot of pages in a relatively short book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know what, Milliband? What a good auxiliary statement, buddy. We should have you on the podcast. Um, yeah, anything else you want to say about Milliband? I don't know. Did we, I mean, did you did, did you um, <laughs> intend to talk about intellectuals at all? You know, the intellectual bit. Yeah, we can talk about the intellectual bit. The intellectual bit kind of almost well, began to rub me as the sports thing I thought was going to rub uh, me. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I initially I wanted to pass over it entirely. Mm. And then I gave it a subsequent reading. Yeah. And was like, oh, maybe there's something here. Maybe it's just because um, it ends with an um, attack on what communist political parties became. Sure. Which is the the only legitimate agency which gets to say who is producing worthwhile intellectual content kind the of catch is more orthodoxy as <laughs> yeah. Miller Band called it we a couple might, chapters we, ago yeah, we might say yeah 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 <laughs> What else do I want to say as an addendum for that? Well, let me just say quickly the bit about the intellectuals, what Milman was talking about was the role of intellectuals in capitalist society and then what the role of socialist intellectuals kind of should be. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so he's, the bit I liked about it, because it's kind of like, I, uh, God, whenever anyone's like, well, the intellectuals must uh, lecture the working class on what is most important. Yeah, but th this, like is, yeah, this is the most, I mean, that 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 is mm -hmm. the thing that sort of, sort of tantalize me most or made me most feel most uncomfortable <laughs> or something like that is this kind of like um you do I, I mean you only have to look at the development of the, the the socialist movement um to see that you get to this point where there are political parties and they really want to draw and empower and give all their um sort of draw all their inspiration to give the ultimate agency to the working class but at the same time they often end up uh being the arbiters mm. of uh, what is like legitimate yeah. um sort of working class thought what the tactic is kind of thing like mm. th there is this impulse to have the working class lead um and set the agenda but at the same time the sort of countervailing tendency to feel like they need to lead and set the agenda kind of thing. And yeah. at various political parties, various people, even the same people at different parts in their sort of like political career, have like yeah. um, sort of pulled in both of those two directions kind of thing. And then at a certain point in the development of sort of like socialist communist history, you just get to the particularly like um, the sort of um, the official communist parties of the various European countries that basically just fell under the the sort of like watchful eye and the sway of the Soviet Communist Party um, basically sort of like abandoned entirely any concession or sort of rhetorical commitment to yeah. uh, letting the working class make the decisions empowering them but rather sort of like set themselves up as the sort of like ultimate arbiters of uh, what is what is legitimate Mm. intellectual but also cultural production sort of artistic production exactly kind of yeah. And, and it, yeah and he, and he just said it, it, I mean it, it, it leaves it on this sort of like similarly quite open it's a, similar to the, to the discussion of like how um, how the Soviet Union has dealt with sport kind of thing like there's this kind of like how are we to avoid getting in the position where we have that happen right where yeah I but think, no, yeah, yeah. Go on. Say what I, you I were going to say, say, and then I've just had another thought that was also quite interesting to me. But <laughs> yours might be say, the same one. Yeah, yeah, it's probably it might not be as good. 
I was just going to say that I think that is ex- absolutely what's going to happen if you have this t- just despicable pedantic attitude of like the intellectual must lead the way yeah you know yeah, what i mean because it's like obviously you want to have somebody who's like going around giving these ideas to people yeah. but it's like to call it an intellectual is to be the most anti-socialist like elitist thing yeah, ever yeah, yeah. it's like let me yeah, give yeah maybe the, maybe the problem is the designation intellectual right because mm-hmm. what, I, what i'm struggling with is this kind of like at what point does someone become an intellectual yeah. as opposed to just a regular joe kind of mm-hmm. thing um and although we want to encourage people to make that transition, to learn more about things, to develop their capacities, I mean, that's the that's the only transition to socialism I'm interested in, where people <laughs> become more empowered and more able to take charge of more things in their exactly. lives and actually be in the position to take over the running of society, which we're not in the position to do at the moment kind mm. of thing. Um, so we need to encourage sort of like uh, discovery and what have you, um, and, and sort of learning and the like, but... At the same time, there is this history of like intellectuals separating themselves from I, either separating themselves from the themselves working above. class, or just being an op- they're just being an opportunity to sort of like just another opportunity to nitpick or to like litigate and say like you're too intellectual and not working class enough, or you're mm-hmm. uh, you're still immature and ignorant in your <laughs> ideas and you need to develop them more kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so maybe we just have to abandon that whole... Uh, somehow, but it, yeah, it's easy enough to say we need to abandon it, but it does feel like something we continually have to grapple with. Mm. Um, I mean, maybe we don't because we're not in a particularly... The, the the working class movement or the socialist movement not in a particularly powerful position to have it be a concern, perhaps, but um, it's something that does... I haven't found a way in my own brain to sort of organise the pieces yeah. in a way which feels comfortable kind of thing. That, I think, is... Yeah, I agree. I think it's also just very much, like, Marxists getting way too inside their head yeah, where it's yeah. like, oh, my God, we need, like, a Gramsci to come along and explain this to the working class. <laughs> it's like, you really don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that you're being exploited. Yeah, and once yeah, you have yeah. that laid out in front of you, everything else is just going to fall into line. You don't need to know the, like, well, uh, three reasons why uh, Marxists are wrong to yeah, call I mean, the state I, an instrument of class maybe part oppression. of the problem is that, like, People discover sort of like Marxism, socialism at universities. Yeah, uh, well, quite at universities, but also just like they they have no way of um, transmitting those ideas to people in a sort of like understandable. Except for podcasts. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're not saying anything about podcasts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> check, check. Are we intellectuals <laughs> oh, of some no. sort? <laughs> oh no! I did forget to say we will next week. We will be having Paul Potts uh, relative <laughs> coming on the show. I'm just gonna... <laughs> Dan just threw his glasses because Dan does wear glasses. So that's all I'm saying. That's I'm why I wear contacts. <laughs> just kidding. I don't wear contacts. I'm not a fucking nerd. Um, <laughs> the one thing I did like about <laughs> the one thing I did like about that intellectual conversation was he bought up why capitalist uh, intellectuals just suck. And it's like wow, we see this so much now. Allow me to read. He says, the Marxist assessment is the more realistic one. The majority of those who could properly be called intellectuals in bourgeois society, not to speak of professional people of one sort or another, lawyers, architects, accountants, doctors, scientists, etc., people that wear glasses, (laughs) etc., have been the managers of legitimation of our society. Nor have they been less such because they were, for the most part, unaware that this was the role that they were performing. In other words, they not only propagated, but shared to the full shared to the full in the illusion of universalism, which was described earlier as the false consciousness of the bourgeoisie. Um, Tend to think of kind of the average debate me folks, right? On YouTube (laughs) and stuff. It's like, oh boy, the intellectuals of today. (laughs) Um, Yeah, anyway, I I don't know. I didn't have much to add. He kind of just sums it up there. But it's like, yes, the people who... It's, he kind of ties this into last week's reading about Jack Sipes because he's basically like the culture that we produce, the intellectuals that we produce are being produced in a capitalist fashion by capitalists in terms of culture, like by capitalist countries or not countries, companies, things like that. So they're probably going to be, if not like overtly pro-capitalist, partially pro-capitalist in their uh, undertakings because it's just what you would expect. That's structuralism, baby. <laughs> I think. I don't know. <laughs> Um, oh dear, maybe we need to read some to read, Yeah, I know, jeez um, or, Yeah, yeah Or watch a good YouTube video maybe Yeah, we'll just watch Jordan Peterson, I think we'll get it um, Well, there it is <laughs> Talk about a man sitting on his own brain <laughs> Yeah, no kidding It's very smooth brain <laughs> Oh man, yeah, what a guy All those folks, gotta love him um, 
I saw you sent me something recently. I forgot the guy's name who wrote it. It was a guy who was writing for Salvage. Um, oh, yeah, What was yeah, that yeah, guy's yeah, name? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> we'll add it in here. His name uh, was? Uh, Richard Seymour. Is it Richard Seymour? Richard. Sure. Oh, okay. Richard. That sounded like Richard. we were just guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard Seymour. He had I also, just, I, I believe... just be very careful not to say Richard Spencer. Basically. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> yeah. Dan sent me something by uh, Ben Shapiro the other day that I found quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. No, but Richard Seymour, I, I looked him up and he had also written a book about Christopher Hitchens, which I kind of like to read because Christopher okay. Hitchens is such a guy who was like, I, even yeah. like Noam Chomsky was like, you gotta love him. And I've known a this, lot of people break. make a case for, Rich, uh, for Christopher, Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. Um, He's the one that died, right? Not the, he is yeah, the one yeah, that sorry, died, guys. Okay, He's get, one of the ones get that my died. my Hitchens is confused. Um, <laughs> the other Christopher Hitchens. There's Peter Hitchens, his brother. Oh. But anyway. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh. right. he's still there. Mm. He's, he's very much more conservative. Well, well. Not the, not yeah. the, not the Christopher <laughs> Hitchens. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, anyway. Where, where anyway. Him, I just thought it was interesting because... But yeah, sorry. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people make a defense of him and I don't uh, know, necessarily know what that is. So I think it's just that there was a bit of an arc of like, most of those guys, like the kind of Richard Dawkins and people like that, it's like, I will admit when I was in middle school and high school, I was like, damn, dude, there are people out here talking about atheism? That's pretty radical. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you realize that it's like, oh, that was the Enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> and like all of what we're reading, it's like anti-Enlightenment stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And then they went and bombed Iraq. <laughs> then they went and bombed Iraq. And Sam Harris. <laughs> Sam Harris was like, hell yes, bomb more Iraqis. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's it. maybe some of that. Some of that. Some of the reading, not some of the bombing. Uh, yeah, maybe a little this bit of that. This is an anti-bombing podcast. As we've said before, this is an anti-bombing podcast. Um, well, we have said that before. We have. We've said it last <laughs> week or the week before. I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. I mean, bombing happens a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, Ralph Miliband, Chapter 3, Defense of the Old Order, Part 1. <laughs> chapter 4, Section 1, Defense of the Old Order, Part 2. Um, great book. I, I will just say, in all seriousness, as much as we like to joke about really liking Ralph Miliband, if you are someone who has been calling themselves a socialist ever since you voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016, <laughs> please read this book because it's, uh, it's a, I would say it's a step beyond entry level just because it's not just giving you the typical Marxism like, here's what you should think as a Marxist, put on your Lenin hat and you know do your Marxist thing. It, he, he does question a lot of things and he's smart and good guy. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it, he's someone, it seems to be someone who has both um, uh, been... Uh, parallel to all these movements and part of them but also separate in a way which he seems to have a perspective yeah. on uh, the history of socialism up until well in this case 1977 or yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 good guy um, we didn't bring up Warhammer this week which is a shame yeah. we'll get yeah. to that um, some other time hopefully um, did a lot of that last week did a lot the audience has ever break week. I think yeah uh, yeah break. more so Star Trek I that wish we talked about yeah we talked some yeah. more Star Trek at some point mm. talk some more Star Trek mm. Mm, yeah, I have to I've, been disc- I've, been, I've been quite enjoying um, Discovery. Yeah, I don't know. Been, I, I'm, yeah. I'm rationing myself because I'm quite enjoying it and I don't want to sort of binge gotcha. it. And also, it's not all out yet, so it's mm. gradually. Yeah, yeah. I've seen two or three episodes, four episodes of the mm. new season, and um, I'm enjoying it. Mm. I'm enjoying it. You should watch. Maybe you should watch Star Trek Discovery. Yeah. Like or just some Deep Space Nine. I, yeah, I do need to finish, actually, finish Deep Space Nine. I like Deep Space Nine a lot. Um, I just love Ferengi. You know what I mean? Give me all the Ferengi episodes in Next Generation. Give me all of that. I love them. Love Ferengi. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, folks. Folks, you've come to the end. Another week, you've come to the, you've made it to the end of the show. And we'd just like to say thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, this has been Auxiliary Statements, talking again about Marxism and politics. Ralph Miliband. There we're will gonna, be more. There, there will, will be definitely more. be more. Because we thought we were going to read a lot more of this this time around, and we didn't. Uh, so but there will be more, and then there will be more after that, presumably. This is just going to be the book that keeps on giving. <laughs> so um, this has been Auxiliary Statement. My name is Jack. Still. Still. My name is still Dan. And if that changes next week, be suspicious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll see you next time. Here we go. <laughs>